It was the first production jet to fly at twice the speed of sound, the first aircraft to scream past 100,000 feet after taking off under its own power. It was a masterpiece of engineering, a creation from the legendary mind of Clarence Kelly Johnson and his Skunk Works team. They called it the missile with a man in it, and it looked the part. A long, needle-nosed fuselage with razor-thin, stubby wings that seemed almost too small to function. In 1958, it shattered the world records for speed, altitude, and time to climb, holding all three at the same time. But this gleaming spear of silver, this promise of untouchable air power, would soon earn a collection of much more terrifying names. To some, it was the Flying Coffin. To the pilots of the German Luftwaffe, who would suffer the most, it was simply the Widowmaker. Over its service life, the Starfighter's accident rate became the stuff of dark legend, with hundreds of aircraft and their pilots lost not in combat, but in routine flight. So what was the dark reason this beautiful, record-shattering jet killed so many of its own pilots and became one of the most dangerous aircraft ever flown? To really get the Starfighter, you have to go back to the skies over Korea in the early 1950s. American pilots in their F-86 Sabres were often finding themselves outclimbed and outrun by the Soviet MiG-15. The U.S. Air Force came back with a new demand. They didn't want a jack of all trades. They wanted a master of one. They needed a pure, lightweight interceptor that cared about two things above all else, raw speed and climbing to altitude faster than anything the enemy could throw at them. This was a philosophy that spoke directly to Lockheed's chief engineer, the brilliant and demanding Kelly Johnson. Johnson bucked the era's trend of bigger, heavier, more complex fighters. He envisioned a simple, lightweight aircraft wrapped around a single, monstrously powerful engine. His design philosophy, famously known as keep it simple, stupid, was all about stripping away anything that didn't make it go faster. The result was the F-104 and its design was radical. Most jets of the time used swept or delta wings to balance speed and lift. Johnson's team, however, found that for pure supersonic performance, the best shape was a tiny, thin, straight trapezoidal wing. These wings were so thin, with a leading edge so sharp they had to be covered on the ground to keep from injuring the crew, that they couldn't hold fuel or landing gear like a normal plane. Everything was crammed into that long, sleek fuselage. This was an aircraft built for one job and one job only, to be a missile with a man in it, a guided rocket meant to scream into the sky, take out a bomber, and come straight back home. And at that job, it was a staggering success. When the F-104A entered service in 1958, it was a quantum leap in performance, the undisputed king of speed and altitude. But all that record-breaking performance came at a steep price. The very design choices that made the F-104 a supersonic monster also baked in a set of unforgiving and lethal habits. The dream of a perfect interceptor was about to slam into the harsh reality of just flying the thing day to day. The first and most obvious problem was those tiny wings. While they were magnificent for slicing through the air at Mach 2, they were disastrous at low speeds. This gave the F-104 an astronomically high landing speed, which could push past 200 miles per hour on final approach. For pilots coming from slower, more forgiving jets, this was terrifying. There was almost zero margin for error. One moment of inattention, one slight miscalculation, and the jet would drop like a stone. Then there was the T-tail. The horizontal stabilizer was put way up on top of the vertical fin to keep it out of the wing's turbulent air during supersonic flight. 
but this created a deadly trap. At a high angle of attack, with the nose pitched up steeply, the stubby wings would block airflow to the tail, rendering it useless. This phenomenon, known as a pitch-up, meant the pilot would lose all control of the plane's nose, leading to a sudden, unrecoverable stall. The jet would just tumble out of the sky. This wasn't some theoretical risk. It was a known, built-in flaw that claimed numerous lives. These two issues, the unforgiving wings and the treacherous T-tail, meant that pilots were flying a plane that was inherently unstable and dangerous at the very beginning and end of every flight. The parts that should be routine, takeoff and landing, became high-stakes gambles. The Starfighter's aerodynamic quirks were only half the story. The machine itself was a bundle of cutting-edge, but often unproven technologies that had a nasty habit of failing, turning small problems into deadly emergencies. At the heart of the F-104 was the mighty General Electric J-79 engine. It was a marvel, but early models were notoriously temperamental. They were prone to sudden compressor stalls and flameouts, where the engine just quits. For a single-engine plane with the glide ratio of a brick, an engine failure at low altitude was a death sentence. In Germany, engine-related issues were a factor in more than half of a sample of reviewed accidents. The powerful heart of the Starfighter was also one of its biggest weaknesses. Making the engine problem even worse was arguably the single deadliest design choice on early Starfighters, the downward-firing ejection seat. Because of that high T-tail, engineers were afraid a pilot ejecting upward would smash into it. Their solution was the Stanley C-1, a seat that shot the pilot downwards out of the bottom of the plane. While that made sense at high speed and high altitude, it was a catastrophic flaw during the most common emergencies, engine failure on takeoff or a loss of control close to the ground. A pilot in trouble needed to get away from the ground, not be fired directly at it. Countless pilots died because they were in an unrecoverable situation below the minimum altitude needed for the seat to work. Korean War ace Ivan Kinchilo was killed when he ejected from his F-104 at low altitude. The seat fired him into the ground before his chute even had a chance to open. Later models were eventually refitted with conventional upward-firing seats, but for hundreds of early pilots, their only escape route was a direct path to the ground. Even the systems designed to help the pilot could turn deadly. To generate more lift from the tiny wings for landing, the F-104 used a boundary layer control system that blew hot air from the engine over the flaps. But this system was completely dependent on engine power. If the engine's RPM dropped for any reason, like a flameout or a throttle issue, the system would fail, the jet's stalling speed would jump dramatically, and a safe landing became nearly impossible. Every system was tangled together in a web where one failure could trigger a catastrophic cascade, overwhelming the pilot in seconds. Nowhere did this deadly combination of flaws cause more devastation than in West Germany. In the early 1960s, the newly reformed German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, chose the Starfighter as its main combat aircraft. What happened next became a national crisis. Germany bought 916 Starfighters. Between 1961 and 1989, a staggering 292 of them crashed. 116 German pilots lost their lives. During the worst of the crisis in the mid-1960s, a German F-104 was falling out of the sky on average once every two weeks. The public was furious, and the jet earned its grim title, the Widowmaker. So why was it so bad in Germany? It was a disastrous mix of the wrong mission, inexperience, and terrible circumstances. The F-104 was designed as a high-altitude, clear-weather interceptor, but NATO's Cold War strategy needed a low-level, all-weather fighter-bomber. So Germany's F-104G model was crammed with heavy, complex avionics for this new role. It was often flown overloaded with external fuel tanks and bombs, forcing it into a mission it was never built for. 
screaming at high speed just a few hundred feet off the ground in the notoriously awful weather of Central Europe. This was the most dangerous kind of flying imaginable in a plane totally unsuited for the job. The pilots were also at a huge disadvantage. Many were coming for much slower, more forgiving jets. Their training was often rushed, and there was a critical shortage of two-seat trainer versions of the F-104. They were often trained in the sunny, clear skies of Arizona, only to be sent back to the gray, rainy murk of Germany, where flying into the ground became a common cause of accidents. In a horrific incident in June 1962, four F-104s practicing for an airshow crashed in formation, killing all four pilots. The pressure on maintenance crews was just as intense. The F-104G was a complex machine that needed meticulous care, but Germany had shortages of trained technicians and spare parts. It was a total systemic failure. An unforgiving aircraft was being flown in the wrong role by pilots who weren't fully prepared, in an environment that punished the slightest error. The tragic result was entirely predictable. Canada, which used the Starfighter in a similar low-level role, had an even higher loss rate, losing 110 of its 238 jets, nearly 46% of its entire fleet, with 37 pilots killed. So, what was the reason the F-104 Starfighter killed so many pilots? It wasn't one thing. It wasn't just the tiny wings or the unreliable engine. It wasn't just the downward ejection seat or the tricky T-tail. And it wasn't just pilot inexperience. The reason, in fact, is that the F-104 Starfighter was a perfect storm. It was a case of a brilliant but specialized design being pushed far beyond its limits. Its flaws, which might have been manageable in its original role as a high-altitude interceptor, became exponentially more deadly when it was forced into the brutal low-level strike mission. The unforgiving handling, combined with technical weak points like the engine and ejection seat, created an aircraft with almost no room for error. This deadly combination of design and mission was then handed to pilots and organizations that weren't ready for its incredible demands. Every accident was a link in a chain where a technical problem was amplified by a design flaw, which was then made worse by human factors in a high-stress environment. The legacy of the Widowmaker is a tragic but vital lesson in aviation history. It's a cautionary tale about the dangers of technological ambition and the absolute importance of matching a machine to its mission. The F-104 was a monument to the pursuit of pure speed, a beautiful and record-shattering jet that reached for the stars. But for the 116 German pilots and the hundreds of others who lost their lives, it became their coffin. It was a flawed masterpiece that all too often, and all too tragically, fell back to Earth. If you found this look into aviation history compelling, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more deep dives into the world's most incredible machines. And let us know in the comments, what other legendary aircraft with a dark story should we cover next? Thanks for watching.